Hello, and welcome to Don't Ignore the Elephant, the podcast where we talk about the stuff that no one else will, the elephant in the room. I'm Liz O'Riordan. I'm a breast cancer surgeon with breast cancer, and during my career, I've had a lot of elephants to deal with. I've learned that talking about them, getting them out in the open, can help you know that you're not alone. Whether it's cancer or other illnesses, mental health issues, sexual problems, bullying, harassment, or the death of a loved one, there are loads of things that can be hard to discuss. I know how powerful it can be to hear someone else talk honestly about their own problems. Some of my guests have lived these experiences, whilst others have dedicated their lives to helping those who have. I'm going to be chatting to them about it and asking the questions everyone else is too afraid to ask. In this episode, we'll be talking about bulimia, binge eating and body image. One of the things I've learned since I had breast cancer is how important it is to exercise. We know that weekly aerobic and resistance sessions can improve the side effects of treatment and reduce the risk of it coming back by up to 50%. Now, I realise that as a cyclist, I wasn't doing enough, which is how I met this week's guest, Clara Swedland. Clara is an online physique coach who also competes as a natural bodybuilder in the bikini category. And she helped me, aged 46, get fitter and stronger than I had ever been in my 20s. She's also studying sports psychology and understands how important mental strength is when it comes to tackling a fitness goal. And it's a topic which is close to her heart, because you've guessed it, there's an elephant here that I haven't mentioned yet. Clara struggled with binge eating and the eating disorder bulimia when she was younger, and she knows better than most the pressures we feel to have the so-called perfect body and how thin the line between healthy and unhealthy behaviours is. I'm so grateful that she's sharing her story with me today. Welcome, Clara, to Don't Ignore the Elephant. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. It's such a pleasure and honour to be here and to join you and your listeners in this conversation. You're welcome. And so let's jump right in with the elephant in the room. Yes. When did you first develop bulimia? Um, so it's something that gradually started to happen when I was, I think, about 15 years old. And it's something that I was never explicitly diagnosed by a psychologist by it, but I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, as a kid, I was always very just really interested in human behavior and I was always interested in addictions and like mental health issues from like from the age of about nine I'd ask my parents really strange questions about you know why do people become alcoholics and why do people do this and I was just really interested in in human behavior in general and so I was very aware of what eating disorders were from maybe about the age of 10 or 11. Um, and I think that was maybe one of the first times that in a journal that I kept, and I've kept a journal from from a young age, that I noted in there that I thought I was fat and that I had to lose weight. And I just think that it was something that I was aware of and I kind of understood, but the behaviors themselves didn't quite fully flesh out until I was maybe 15, 16. Now it was summertime and I was deeply, just deeply dissatisfied with how I looked and how I felt in my body. And there were a lot of other stresses going on in my life. Um, I'm a perfectionist. So food had always, and my body image has been something that I always tried to control. And um, mm-hmm. this particular summer, I was in a relationship and things weren't great. And I remember quite clearly, actually, I was on holiday with my family and my parents were out and I was just in the Airbnb or hotel or wherever we were staying with my brother. Mm -hmm. And I'd had just a bit too much for breakfast. I'd eaten past the point of of discomfort, really. And I just went to the bathroom and... And essentially, yeah, that I, I made myself sick for the first time. Um, and that's kind of where it started and then just sort of went downhill from there. And I wasn't stuck in that rut of, you know, purging in that, in that way for very long until my parents found out. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of stopped immediately there. But the the behavior or the tendency or the dissatisfaction with my body image that persisted for quite a few more years after that, really, until my uh, my early 20s. So for about five to six years, it was something that was always, I suppose, like in the back of my mind or part of my experience. And I think I relate to that so much. So looking back through my diaries, a lot of them were, I'm fat, I need to lose weight. And uh, mm. at school and at university, I was very aware that although I was slim, there were people thinner than me. And 
eating became something I used to control my behavior and how I felt. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I think that it's so, it's so common, particularly for those of us, uh, and I'm including you because you're a doctor and I think maybe I'm making the assumption, but most doctors are very, very high, hard workers and high achievers, but a lot of us who end up struggling with, with difficulties around food and around body image, um, it tends to be, or there seems to be a pattern, at least in the research where, it's linked to perfectionistic tendencies and sort of that high, high achiever mentality where, of course, being 100% and being perfect is absolutely impossible in the real world. So we strive or we seek, you know, these tangible variables or what seems to be tangible, such as food regulation or exercise regulation, and cling on to those as a means to, you know, regulate our emotions, regulate uh, how we feel about ourselves, and find a way to manage those feelings, I suppose. It's almost a way of blocking out what you're really dealing with, isn't it? Mm, By just absolutely. controlling it with food. How did you get help? Was it your family who realised what you were doing or...? Ah, gosh. Well, the first time around when I was a teenager, I told my partner at the time, my boyfriend, and he knew that I'd kind of been struggling with food, but he didn't know the extent of it. I hadn't told anybody because I was typically when I was home alone after lunch, after school, like my brother was younger than me, my parents were at work. That's kind of when things would spiral a little bit for me. So it was very, very easy to keep it a secret. But my boyfriend at the time asked me kind of how I was getting on with the food stuff. (laughs) That's sort of how he phrased it. And I said that it was going terribly. And he basically broke down there and then and said, you have to tell your parents today and you, you know, I'm going to leave when your parents arrive because we were at my parents' house at the time. Yeah. He said, and you're going to tell them right now. And that's sort of what happened. And my parents, you know, they were incredibly supportive. We went to see a family psychologist and yeah. know, they, they were they were amazing at supporting me. But unfortunately, I, I knew I knew how to play the game. Were you overweight at the time? No, no, I've, I've never been overweight. I've never been underweight. Yeah. I've always, you know, been very healthy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that it was never, ever something like that. But yeah, you know, my parents, we went to see a psychologist and uh, the surface behavior stopped, but the inner feeling of mm. hating the way I looked, that persisted for, for, like I said, many more years. And it wasn't until I was, after I graduated from university, actually, I started working as an administrator, as a secretary and a mental health practice and a private mental health practice. Wow. And at the same time, I got my qualification as a Zumba instructor and started Uh teaching Zumba classes. And I think it was a combination of both factors being in that environment where mental health was discussed, where I was getting access to resources, where I started to really question not just my behavior, but really think, actually, this is no way to live. Like I shouldn't be suffering this much on my own. And then that combined with the fact that twice a week I was standing up in front of a group of women Mm. telling them that they should be empowered in their bodies through music and through movement. And I just called BS on my own behavior. I was like, you can't be doing this. This is so hypocritical. Um, And I knew I was going to be going in to study my master's in sport and exercise psychology. And I knew that the type of psychologist I wanted to be was not one who couldn't practice what they preached essentially and it was a combination of all those factors that through a lot of my own self-development work like I said getting access to you know just just documents that the psychologists around me were using with their clients uh, I would then go and read all of it myself and I would do the worksheets and I would do all this all this work myself and that allowed me to essentially pull myself of the out of the rut that I was in because at this point it wasn't so much bulimia it was uh, you know binge eating and then I suppose purging through exercise exercise addiction in a way it was that but it was also it was more like exercise as a means to burn calories Not it you. wasn't exercise for the enjoyment of movement exercise for the empowerment of me as a person it was exercise to destroy it was exercise because yeah. I have eaten too many Oreos over the weekend and I am therefore worthless as a human yeah. so I must burn these calories off through exercise to punish yourself I guess yeah yeah it wasn't yeah. it was certainly not a healthy relationship with it and yeah. it was very on and off so it was very much like Monday to Friday super intense Saturday Sunday nothing so yeah. there was no you can't keep it up can you no that's it it was very very black and white so all those factors just kind of I, I think I just hit a wall where I went this is no way to live and I don't want to live like this but from the moment where I made that 
conscious choice myself to when I actually started to open up about my experience like there was a few months in between because I think there's a lot of shame that goes with particularly with binge eating uh, or any kind of disordered eating patterns there's just a lot of shame and because it's such an easy experience to hide uh, and it's so easy to keep it a secret uh, particularly when you don't present with any changes in your body weight or any changes in your physical appearance it was almost like yeah just just very easy to quote unquote get away with it yeah so it was a combination of factors but more so being in the in the right environment and positioning myself in the fitness industry and in a place of influence where I realized actually (laughs) this needs to change you've got to practice what you preach really haven't you a hundred percent a hundred percent and that was really valuable to me to realize um because that's kind of when the penny dropped yeah so here's a question why do Mm -hmm. you think eating disorders still disproportionately affect women I think that society in general has a big role to play in this. And this is just my opinion. I don't know what the research says, but I think that society in general, the way we position women uh, and the demands that we place on women and their appearance are so incoherent for one and impossible to uphold uh we've yeah. got so many contradictory messages coming left right and center i'm sure there's been studies done where they assess the language that we use to praise young girls and young boys and already the difference in in what the types of adjectives that we use to do that uh already yeah dominate and focus more on appearance and focus more on people pleasing and focus more on appeasing others and almost in in reinforcing this notion that as women in general our bodies are there for other people to observe and, and to really comment on in the media I mean it's crazy isn't <laughs> well, it? exactly it's it's absolutely mind-blowing and I know I used to struggle with you know what is the perfect body because it goes from Kate Moss to Kim Kardashian overnight well, who are you meant to look like I think it is I so hard at the moment oh it really is and it's I'm grateful that I did not grow up in an era where social media was a thing because I honestly I feel oh. for the young people nowadays again just that messaging is 200 times louder than when it was when you know when I was a teenager and I would maybe look up and pick up a cosmopolitan magazine it's so hard and I think as you said there that question of well what is the perfect body I think we're missing the question of well what does that look like for you and how do we define these things and who is providing these definitions I know where do you think the line lies between a healthy desire for weight loss and an eating disorder? Because I know when I was getting lean with you for a mm-hmm. photo shoot, it can be dangerously addictive yep. to enjoy seeing the results. And how do you know when to stop? I think it's always the subjective experience of the of the individual going through it. Um, I don't necessarily think there's a, a particular bracket where we go, right, this is enough or this isn't enough. I think it's always down to how that person is experiencing the relationship with their changing body. And what I mean by that is that, as you said, it can be very rewarding and very extrinsically and intrinsically rewarding to see Mm. your hard work pay off and to see yourself, um, you know, get leaner in this case. But it's, being able to to be detached enough from our bodies and also I think uh derive self-worth and self-meaning from things that aren't just contained to our physical body um and almost in line with that to expand the way that we view our body that is not just oh I'm looking great therefore I am great yeah allowing ourselves to have a more holistic approach and holistic relationship and kind of relationship with our body where we almost try and nurture that self-worth and that self-validation beyond just the physicality of it It's so important. So having Mm -hmm. said that, we need to have a really healthy relationship with our body. You have gone into one of the most craziest sports. (laughs) Into So for me, bodybuilding, I think Sylvester Stallone, I think Schwarzenegger, I think those huge muscular women with no breasts and thick legs and shoulders. How did you realize that was a place for you? Because you're tiny. And then to think, I'm going to do a sport with a background of eating disorders that makes me gain like 10% of my body weight and lose every year? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And it's it's an interesting story, if I'm honest. So I'd 
gotten into the gym when I first moved to Scotland from Spain slash France, which is uh-huh. where I live, where I grew up. And I've never been into sport. I've been a dancer my whole life, but I've always despised sport with a passion. I'm I'm not great at it at all. Was it ironic considering I'm a trainee sport and exercise psychologist? <laughs> but anyway, so when I moved to Scotland, I could see the uni gym from my uh, hall's window. And I thought, you know what, this is a great, you know, I've moved to Scotland, new, new life, new uni, new me, Mm -hmm. I'm going to start going to the gym. And I just developed such a passion for training. And at this point, it was just, I just loved being at the gym. I don't know what it was about it, but I just started to realize how great it made me feel and Mm -hmm. how much better I was coping with normal life stresses, such as moving away from home when you're 18 and going to a new country. Um, and that's yeah. sort of where my interest in exercise psychology spanned from. Um, I realized actually there's so much more to this and there's so much psychology behind our exercise behavior. I want to study that. And that kind of set me on that path of, okay, exercise psychology is what I'm going to do with my career. And like I said, when I graduated from uni, I was in quite a dark place with regards to binge eating and sort of my self-worth and my body image, but I was still trying to get to the gym. And once I'd sort of pulled myself out of that hole and I was in a better place, I thought, right, you know what? I feel like I need a goal. I know I've got the perseverance, the the motivation to be at the gym. I'm, you know, I'm a hard worker. If you tell me what to do, I'll kind of do it. And I know mm-hmm. I will. And that's when I reached out to a coach that I'd sort of seen, a, a, heard about online. I knew that they worked with uh, some pretty big names on campus when I was um, at university. And I reached out to them and said, look, you know, I'm going to be going to Loughborough, which for those of you who might not be aware is one of the biggest, if not the biggest sports university in the UK. Uh, And I said, you know, I'm going to be studying sport and exercise psychology there. I want to be in the best shape of my life for when that comes. And this was Vaughan Wilson, who's still currently my coach and is now my business partner. And we basically just put a plan in place. And I said, you know, I want to do a fitness photo shoot. Mm -hmm. And as I got into the process, I just fell in love with going to the gym and getting stronger every week and lifting heavy weights. And as you said, I'm tiny. I'm five foot two on a good day. A strong's never, it would have never been an adjective I would have used to describe myself or that anyone would have probably used to describe me any physically (laughs) anyway. And, and just to see myself getting stronger week up on week, I thought this is the best thing on this planet. And it kind of tied in with my own personal development around overcoming that lack of self-worth or that, that sort of self-hatred towards my body. It just it almost like both realities couldn't coexist for me at that time. So it just, the process of bodybuilding as opposed to competitive bodybuilding became almost like an escape or or relief or a way of for me to reinforce that actually my body is amazing and to really develop that that love for for my body and its own abilities and um through discussions with Vaughn he kind of asked me one day you know have you thought about competing and I thought competing in what <laughs> I knew <laughs> nothing about bodybuilding it was such a foreign world to me uh, but of course, you know, you plant the seed and Instagram was, you know, a bigger, bigger thing. And, you know, yep. I started following a few accounts and I thought, you know what, this looks like so much fun. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, I've never been into sport, but I've been a dancer my whole life. So performing yep. and being on stage, that is my bread and butter. Like as a kid dressing up, I would parade myself around the house, you know, with <laughs> anything. It could be a sock on my head or a sparkly bikini. It, it was anything at all. Yep. So this just looked like my childhood fantasies coming to real life. I love um, it. But it of it's course, something the- to go from, so from being a Zumba instructor to wanting to pose in a thong bikini on stage. Yes, it is an absolute 180. And for someone who a few months prior to even choosing to step on stage, um, I was on holiday in New Zealand with my family for Christmas and New Year's Eve. And I remember just not wanting to be in a bikini, wanting to hide away. Just so I was so ashamed of my body at the time because I just felt like I had been rec- trying to recover, you know, from my binge eating tendencies. Yeah, but I was still deeply dissatisfied with how I looked. And to sort of think to myself, actually, this is maybe something I can do. And it was almost like the the thought of the challenge of putting myself on a stage in a bikini to be judged by a panel of judges just on how I looked. It was like the wildest of dreams or, or nightmares. I wasn't sure at the time, to be honest. Um, but I thought, you know what? It's terrifying and it sounds like a challenge for me. So 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go for it and I was dieting already for my photo shoot I was maybe nine weeks away from from you know being sort of photo shoot ready and mm-hmm. I found a show that was three weeks afterwards and I thought oh you know what's what's another three weeks well it was the hardest three it. weeks of that whole prep <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I just thought you know what let's just do this and if I hate it I hate it and I never do it again but if I love it I love it and of course I came off stage I didn't know what I was doing at the time yeah. that I had the best time of my life and I thought you know I, it was obvious to me that I didn't know what I was doing but the minute I stepped off I was like right I'm done with dieting for now but I, I'm gonna do this again I am 100% doing this again. So for people who aren't sure what bodybuilding means how much weight do you gain or lose in a year and why do you do it? Okay, so I suppose this is all relative. So we'll use my highest and my lowest weight points for reference. So there's about 15 kilos in between. And from my highest to my lowest weight in what would be like an off season, so a gaining phase, I lose about a quarter of my body weight in that time frame. Yeah. So the reason behind trying to gain weight in what would be an off season is so you can build sufficient muscle mass when you are in a calorie surplus. So you're going to the gym and you're training really hard uh, and you need a calorie surplus in order to be able to build muscle tissue and of course as a natural bodybuilder and as a female natural bodybuilder this is incredibly incredibly difficult you really do need to push your butt your body to places where it is going to be more uncomfortable and a calorie surplus and gaining some body fat is going to be absolutely imperative in order to do that and then of course when you compete what you're being judged on is the muscularity uh, but you need to be able to showcase that and that's why you need to pull off all those layers of of body fat that you've gained uh, in order to showcase an incredibly lean physique and now both extremes at at the extremes I don't think it's necessarily you know quote-unquote healthy because at the peak of my off season when I am sort of at my you know, again, I'll, I'll use the word heaviest, but I'm using it very yeah. loosely here. It feels quite uncomfortable, if I'm honest. How many body weight sizes do you go up? And how do you cope with what do you have like three different wardrobes of clothes? Or Yeah, I've got two different wardrobes of clothes. To be fair, because I work in the fitness industry, I spend most of the year in joggers or leggings, which fit any body shape. But yeah. jeans and that yeah, I do go up a couple of sizes depending on the on the shop. But I'm quite good at shopping for clothes that are kind of going to fit me year round yeah and the way you cope with it I think it is just knowing that I I suppose developing your own personal self-worth separate to your body and working on that year round irrespective of what you look like yeah how have you managed to do that how have you managed to accept that you love your body when you're three or four different dress sizes in a year and you don't have that perfect physique all year round because as a bodybuilder you only look that good for about a month of the year don't you yeah and you look good but you feel awful so I don't know if it would be worth it anyway how do you accept yourself when you're at your heaviest or your fluffiest or you don't look as good as you could yeah I think for me it's knowing that the things that I bring to the world and the qualities that I bring to the world as a person uh far expand kind of what I look like and it's something that I I discuss with my clients a lot too uh, particularly those who who find it quite triggering to step on the scales and to see those fluctuations it's kind of asking yourself well you know if I was to ask someone who cares deeply about you someone who loves you what the best three things about you are what would they say and the chances are nobody would ever think to mention your body weight or your body shape or your appearance And I think it's reminding myself that it's just how I present in the world. And also that my body does so much more for me. Kind of there's there's this terminology called um body image flexibility and body sanctification. And it's almost that, I suppose, like metaphorical sense of understanding that your body is what allows you to exist in the world. Like my body yeah. allows me to be a partner, it allows me to be a coach to my clients, it allows me to be a daughter, a friend, a support system. It's what allows me to be in this world and to exist in this world. And so if I start to bully the one thing, almost like the vessel for my soul, if you want to call it that, (laughs) if I bully the one thing that allows me to exist in this world, then what am I really doing to myself? How do I then expect to show up as the best person like that I could be? And that body image flexibility is just the comfort in knowing that my body serves so many more purposes than 
looking a certain way and actually just appreciating all the different things that I can do at different times yeah. of the year. Like now I'm lean, I'm in between competitions and it's great. I love to be able to showcase through my physique, the hard work that I have put in. Uh, but equally when I am in an off season, the curves that I have, the ability to go out for food with my partner or cook a bit more, it, it's allowing that flexibility of, okay, well, what else? can I or can I not do right now as a result of of I suppose my yeah. body shape and what I look like I think it's such an important lesson I mm. I really really struggled when I was diagnosed with cancer so I, I lost my breast mm -hmm. and I felt that I lost my femininity overnight yeah. and then the menopause made me gain 10% of my body weight mm -hmm. and I just I hated myself mm -hmm. all that I ever did as a kid and it is so hard to give yourself a break because yeah. the mirror is always there yeah and it's so easy to look in the mirror and look at everything that you hate. And how can you help us learn to love ourselves? So like, you know me, I, even after working mm -hmm. for a year with Clara and getting really fit and strong, I still wouldn't get my legs out in public. Mm -hmm. And it's how, how do you learn to love yourself? That's a difficult question to answer and one that I could go on so many different Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. I think the main thing is... I suppose starting off like what I said there is understanding what you bring to the world and understanding what your unique qualities and attributes are as a person. If it's hard, because I know that some people find it quite difficult to come up with these things and to say them about themselves, especially in British culture, not to bash it, but British people aren't very good at speaking highly of themselves. And so to be able to sit back and think, OK, well, actually, what would uh, my partner say about me? What would my best friend say about me? And what do they appreciate about me? That can be a really good starting point for you to be able to take that step back and say, actually, I am so much more than my body or than the way that I present myself. And I think then it's also realizing that nobody's judging us as much as we're judging ourselves. And considering also the function of those judgments, I mean, what what purpose do they serve really? Why are we trying to keep ourselves in check? Why are we not giving ourselves yeah. permission to be kind? to ourselves and how what do we fear losing yeah if we were to just stop bullying ourselves in that way and so it's not so much learn how to love yourself but I, I think an, a nicer almost like an easier way to think about it is how can I be a kinder friend to myself how can yeah. I be the person who you know rather than putting myself down I don't have to big myself up straight away but how can I hold my own hand Exactly. in this process and walk alongside me um I quite like thinking about it as a seesaw analogy um mm -hmm. if you think about the self-critic being on the one side it's well how can we balance the self-critic what can I say to the self-critic that might you know balance its argument because of course the self-critic has got a lot to say uh, and sometimes you know it does point towards things that we would like to change as you said there's nothing wrong with say wanting to lose some body weight there's nothing wrong with wanting to lose body fat with wanting to change your body shape but how can we make sure that we do that in such a way that the self-critic isn't dominating that narrative yeah and I think it's realized actually nobody cares what you look like no one's yeah. looking at you because we're also worried about ourselves mm, exactly do you think that people with eating disorders get drawn to the rapid weight gain or loss of bodybuilding and use it as an excuse to fuel their behaviours? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. I think there is a lot to say about that. I think that bodybuilding provides a, I want to say, quote, unquote, safe space for people who struggle mm -hmm. uh, with disordered eating and uh, an impaired relationship with exercise because in the bodybuilding sphere, those behaviours are praised. No one's going to bat an eyelid if you go to a restaurant with a Tupperware and you explain that you're a bodybuilder and that you're dieting for a competition. I mean, people might not understand it, but in the, in the bodybuilding yeah. community, that's completely, yeah. you know, acceptable. Uh, no one's going to question why you're getting up at the crack of dawn to go and do your cardio, to go and do your steps, to, to go and spend all this time exercising. Um, so, of course, it provides a space for people who perhaps struggle already with those things and it almost it, yeah it just masks it I think what becomes then difficult is when the prep is over when the shows are over and yeah. it's imperative that you are no longer stage lean because of course it's, it's incredibly unhealthy and women lose their periods as well don't they when they get yes it, it's very common to develop hypothalamic amenorrhea 
that's when things get problematic. And now there's a lot of people out there who might also say that they developed an eating disorder through bodybuilding and it's quite a contentious subject. But I think that when done properly with the right amount of support, it's not that bodybuilding causes eating disorders. It's just that being in a food focused and exercise focused environment inevitably increases our preoccupation with our body image and food. And it's yeah. then ensuring that before you even consider prepping or dieting or whatever it might be, that you have enough support or that you have a support system in place that can ensure that when things do wobble, you've always got something to fall back on. Exactly. You know, I think I've been like lots of women who mm -hmm. I've looked at the telly, I've seen amazing athletes and I've bought the DVDs and I've sat watching them eating a packet of biscuits thinking I could look like that. And then mm -hmm. I beat myself up because I don't. I think part of it for me was I haven't had that mental light bulb moment to say, right, you're going to get healthy. You're going to do this. You're going to put everything in. Mm -hmm. Is it easy to change your body healthily if you're not happy with it? Could anybody do it? It's easy to change your body, but I think that changing your physique in the long term in a way that is sustainable and healthy cannot occur without changing the mindset and the psychology around it. So yeah. what I mean by that is that you cannot expect to continue to hate yourself and to continue to allow that negative narrative to dominate and then just magically you know, lose 10 kilos and be happy, that it's just not going to yeah. happen. Because if you were unhappy in the first place, and if that negative narrative persists, it, it's not going to matter what you look like, that's exactly. still going to dominate. So it's really important to understand that when you start off a journey such as that of a physique transformation, in order for it to be, I think in order for it to have longevity, you're going to have to be prepared to be vulnerable and to be open to coming face to face with some of those negative thoughts that you might have about yourself and to really question them. And like I said, ask yourself what the purpose of them is, or what function are they serving? And are they serving you? Because without those changes, I genuinely don't think it's possible to develop a healthy relationship with your yeah. body and, and to make that sustainable in the long term anyway. And I think that was really important for me because I remember before we, we kind of started doing anything, you said, well, why do you want to lift weights? Why do you mm -hmm. want to do this? It's like, so am I going to like myself when I'm done it? And I am actually doing it to get fit and strong and healthier after cancer. And the yeah. benefit is actually looking good. But if I don't get there, you kind of still have to like yourself. Yeah, And that's absolutely. something that coaches have to when you take a client on, are they doing it for the right reasons? Oh, I know. And it's such a shame because the fitness industry, unfortunately, is incredibly unregulated. And there's so many coaches out there that they will put a result first over the client's mental well-being. And I think that's a really important thing to, to be mindful of. If you are someone yeah. who's looking to work with a coach, ensuring that your goals are prioritized over their Instagram post of your transformation. Yeah, or the hard sell and the money they want and the supplements Absolutely. you need to pay. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, understanding why why you're engaging in a process is really important because that's going to support the longevity of it. Now, you might not know why you're doing it. You might just want to change and you just need to start somewhere. And that's also OK. And the reasons might evolve and they'll develop, you know, arms and legs as time goes on. I mean, the reason I competed the first time is very different to the reason I compete now in bodybuilding. Yeah. But having a strong enough motive is going to be imperative, particularly if you want it to be sustainable and and I get I keep coming back to the sustainability point because you know being lean and looking shredded and all this type of stuff I mean that's not long-term no, health it's like two weeks a year maybe isn't that's it? it that's it and the long-term health is the behaviors that support that but those behaviors can only be maintained when we feel like we're engaging in them volitionally when we feel yeah. like it's our autonomous choice to do it when we feel like we want to do it because it's important to us and it's aligned with our and values we enjoy it we're not exactly. in the gym because we've been told to. We actually enjoy the sport we're doing. Exactly. And that's why finding something that you enjoy is also so important and not just kind of blindly following the next kind of hot hit on, on the internet. It's why I stopped triathlon because I realized I do not like running. Mm -hmm. Although I'd love to do an Ironman, I'm never going to run a marathon again to do it. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. One of the biggest things you taught me was how to eat properly. 
Mm -hmm. because you kind of know it's 80, 20 in fruit and veg, but I know you talk a lot about how much protein, carbohydrate and fat you should have. So it's mm -hmm. I just weighing out. I realized I didn't eat enough protein yeah. because I don't like protein for breakfast or lunch. I was living off cereal. So I was mm -hmm. suddenly weighing out all my food and my husband thought I was mad or got really <laughs> frustrated and just for goodness sake, and this is important to me, how can you help bring your family to support you or to understand when you are having to weigh out all your food so you know you're getting the right calories? Have you got any tips? I think the best thing is to have an open and honest conversation about it and to not feel ashamed about it either. This is the thing, right? Because society tells us that we need to lose weight, but then when we start to engage in behaviors that we inevitably need to engage in, in order mm -hmm. to lose weight, for example, such as calorie tracking or, you know, weighing out your food, whatever that might be, immediately we're met with a lot of stigma, a lot of shame. We kind of want to hide away from it. We're like, oh, this is really weird. And I think that just having that open and honest conversation and explaining to whoever it is that's unsure about it, why you're doing it and also what it means to you. So bringing again that element of personal significance into it can be really helpful. So rather than shutting them off and going like, oh, you don't understand, like, I need to do this. Because I've done that before and it's it's not a fun conversation to have. <laughs> but, you know, being open and saying, you know, well, I'm trying this new thing. I'm trying to explore kind of what health and fitness could look like if I take it down this avenue. And for me right now, it's important to weigh out the foods that I'm eating in order to ensure that I am meeting my nutritional requirements at this stage. Almost yeah. like explaining it to them. And if you're unsure and if you're working with a coach, your coach can always do that talking for you too. It, okay. it wouldn't be the first time that I've had a conversation with like a client and their partner and it's been their partner asking me questions saying, okay, well, can you explain this to me? Because I'm not too sure about it. And, you know, it's just, it's making sure that you can reassure them and that they also have confidence that these behaviors that on paper might look quite disordered because of course, like yeah. no one has to live the rest of their life weighing their food out. Um, it's just making sure that they understand that it has a purpose and that that you are being taken care of and it's not trying yeah. to fuel unhealthy behavioral patterns and that we are having these conversations and that we are being quite open and honest about it. And actually, it's quite shocking when you realize how much a normal portion of rice is. But it's we'll crazy. <laughs> well, a normal portion of cereal, it's depressing. Yes. Oh, God, I weighed it out. I'm eating like two or three times the amount I meant to. And then my mm -hmm. dog gets the milk left over. Yeah. It's, it's really hard when you are trying to lose weight or be healthy, when every social interaction seems to resolve around food. Yeah. And going out with friends and eating and drinking. And how do you find that balance between enjoying yourself and sticking to your fitness goals? I think it's understanding that if you can be 80% consistent 100% of the time, mm -hmm. having that 20% variance in life and allowing for life to happen, it's not going to damage your goals in the long term. You know, I spoke earlier about black and white and finding the gray space. That is very much the, the gray space. And it's being comfortable in operating in that gray space too. Again, just moving away from what society is telling us that you have to have a green detox juice every morning and do three hours of hot yoga or you are a failure. It's being able to understand that if you can be good enough for most of the time, and if you're consistent enough for most of the time, you're gonna be absolutely fine. And if you do kind of go out for a meal, and if you do have a weekend where you have a couple of drinks and, and a pizza and you're a bit hungover and you don't exercise, it's really not the end of the world. And an analogy I use yeah. all the time is that of the punctured tire. So if you imagine that you're going on holiday, you're going on a road trip and you're buzzing, you've been planning it for ages, you've packed up the mm -hmm. car, you know, you're halfway there on the trip uh, and suddenly you get a punctured tire. What do you do? You get out of the car, you change it or you wait for someone to come and fix it and then you keep going. The last thing yeah. you would do is get out the car and go, oh, well, <laughs> one tire is punctured. I might as well just destroy the other three or turn around and give up on this holiday. You'd never do that. It's ludicrous. You say it out loud. It sounds like a joke. I mean, it is. I know. No, I love this. You told me this. I was having yes. a really, really bad day and I just, the world fall apart and that's sod it. I'm going to go and eat a load of biscuits. I said this with my last guest and my husband won't know because the evidence is gone. <laughs> I've ruined everything. No, you haven't. It's just a punctured tire. Stop self-sabotaging. It's like we can move on. It's okay. And it was just like a light bulb 
We all have wobbles. And I think that's it. It's kind of, it's allowing ourselves the kindness to go, well, I'm human. <laughs> you know, I'm exactly. not a robot. And guess what? Biscuits taste amazing. That's why that 20 and 80% rule is, is the most helpful way, I think, to approach fitness and kind of the longevity of yeah. weight loss and weight loss maintenance, because it's the most realistic way to do it. And it's the most compassionate way to do it too, because if we tell ourselves, right, that's it, Sunday night, I'm going to eat all the biscuits in the house. I'm going to have my last pizza, last pizza forever, last biscuit. I mean, yeah. who are we kidding? Why would you We're want not. to not eat biscuits or pizza for the rest of your life? That's <laughs> just crazy. No one should ever live a life without pizza and, you know, delicious no. foods. So it's being able to find that balance and being able to, to give yourself permission to have that balanced approach and just to be good enough. Good yeah. enough is good enough. And something else to say to clients is, you know, if it's not a 10 out of 10, and if it's a four out of 10, then let's make it a four out of four. What does that yeah. look like? Let's explore that. that. It's just that flexibility, giving yourself permission to be flexible in your approach to health, fitness, exercise, weight yeah. loss, however you might interpret those, those things is probably like my biggest tip <laughs> if I could tell everybody one thing is yeah flexibility 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 in your approach knowing what you know now and the pressures that women's face growing up what advice would you give your younger self to help her cope oh wow that's a really good question I would probably tell her that her self-worth isn't dependent on how she looks Oh. And that actually she brings so much more to the world and that appreciating her body's ability to allow her to be in the world is the greatest gift that she could bring. Because, yeah, without my body, I wouldn't be able to do all the amazing things that I that I do. I wouldn't be able to be a partner, be a daughter, be a sister, be a friend, yeah. be a coach, be in the world, travel, see, meet people, have, con have this conversation. Yeah. You know, my, my body allows me to do that and being able to have that gentle relationship with it and being able to treat myself with that kindness and that respect and dignity is something I really wish I'd been taught sooner that compassion towards myself because again it's that perfectionistic mindset I thought that in order to be the best I really had to yep. I had to be the best so I wasn't the worst right? So it was that yep. very negative, negative perception. Uh, and if you're not the best, then you are inevitably the worst, whereas actually exactly. the good enough approach. I, I wish I could go back and tell myself, you know, good enough is good enough uh, and you'll be fine. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I'm going to take <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> now, before, before we say goodbye, I've just got one more question. Mm -hmm. So I started um, a jar of joy which is basically a goldfish bowl full of cards. Um, when I found out that my cancer had grown during chemo, mm -hmm. it was a really, really low time in my life and I just needed a reason to smile. So every time something good happened, like my husband letting our puppy sit on the sofa, I'd write it on a card and put it in a jar. And there's just something about seeing that visual representation of the goodness in my life that always brings me out of a dark place. And I've started a jar for the podcast. And mm -hmm. as a guest, can you tell us one thing that's made you start smile in the last couple of days so we can add it to the jar? You know what? I was I knew that this question was coming because I've been listening to all the other podcast episodes. Oh, well, thank you. And I was thinking about this in the shower earlier and I was thinking, oh, I really hope can I can I put two things in the jar? Or yes, I have you to can. pick one. Okay. No, fantastic. you can pick two. Okay, that's great. <laughs> because I have two and they're just like they're really, really strong for me. So like I said, I'm currently in between competitions, uh, in between bodybuilding competitions. And my parents have never been able to come and see me compete. And it's not something that they've ever really understood. But finally this year, like I think because it's the third time that I'm doing it, they're starting to, I'm letting them into the world of competing a little bit more too. And this weekend, um, the competition that I was doing, they actually had a live, a live stream. And oh. I sent my mum the link not thinking anything of it I just said oh you know this is a live stream link in case you want to watch it blah, blah blah and I came off stage and I had messages from my parents who'd sat down and had it on the telly screen and they'd sat and watched the live stream of me competing together and it was just oh. the sweetest thing ever I couldn't even put into words like how much it meant to me because it yeah. was just 
amazing that they chose to engage with it it's such a niche sport and they were like we understood nothing but you look great and we thought you should have won <laughs> which was so <laughs> lovely to hear so that would be the first thing that I want to put in the jar is just an appreciation for my parents mm-hmm. and the second thing is that after my competition on Sunday I traveled back up to Scotland and I was mm-hmm. able to take my fiance out for our first meal out uh, in 19 weeks since I had wow. a little break in between competitions. And it was so nice to just be able to take him out for dinner as a thank you, as an appreciation for everything he does for me, not just when I'm prepping, but he's just my central support system. And he does not understand bodybuilding either, but the fact okay. that he supports me in my goals and in doing anything that makes me happy, I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful for him for that. And it was amazing. And obviously I got to go out for food for the first time in 19 weeks. So that was absolutely epic. (laughs) I did see a huge pizza calzone on Instagram. That looked very, very good. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, thank you so much for sharing those with us, Clara. They are definitely going in the jar. Amazing. And thank you so much for talking to us today. All the best for the competitions next week. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to chat to you today. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Don't Ignore the Elephant. I'm so grateful to Clara for speaking so openly and honestly about her eating problems when she was younger. If you or someone you know are struggling with disordered eating, there are some support services listed in the show notes that could help. Please take a look and share them with anyone who might need them. It was fascinating to hear how Clara was able to turn her perception of her body upside down and now sees it for what it is, simply a vessel to help her achieve her goals. I love her punctured tyre analogy and use it a lot. Whenever I have a wobble or I beat myself up because yes, I missed a gym session or a deadline. I'd love to know your tips for being kind to your body when things get tough. We've had so many fantastic comments about all this episode. Jack loved how she reframes anxiety in a positive way. Maria said she listened while doing the ironing and laughed, cried and nodded the whole way through. And Marianne loved Orla's insight about the little ripples we create as we move through life. She said we've definitely set off a couple of ripples for her in Orla's perspective about anxiety. Tell me what you thought about Clara's episode and whether she's helped you love your body just a little bit more. I'm also looking at the jar of joy right now and it's great to see it filling up with last week's entries. Keep them coming. Liz said she helped her daughter choose her wedding dress. That's such a special day. Fiona said turning on the TV and seeing Mary Poppins bringing back happy childhood memories. I love that film too, Fiona. And a lovely lady said that she's just ordered four glass jars for her family. I love that this idea is spreading. Have you started yours yet? In the next episode, I'm going to be speaking about one of the biggest elephants there is, money. I know it's a topic that many people find hard to talk about, especially around Christmas time. My guest, Davinia Tomlinson, founder of Raincheck, helps women take control of their financial futures. I can't wait for you to hear her advice about when to spend it and when to save it. If you've enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so the next episode is ready when you are. And if you listen on iTunes and have a few seconds spare in your day, could you leave a review and let me know what you thought? It helps other people find us so I can help them start talking about their elephants in the room. Thank you for listening. Don't Ignore the Elephant is produced by Birdline Media in association with Elizabeth Richards.